Welcome back to Footy Classified. At various stages throughout the course of this year, we would be introducing Brad Scott as a coach of a definite top four team, or maybe a team who are going to struggle to make the eight. Tonight, it's probably the latter as he joins us. Welcome, Scotty. Thanks, Where Jerry. do you sit, your footy club? It is an intriguing situation right now. You were uh, the buzz side of the summer months, no question about that. That's not of your doing. That's mm. of more of our doing, of course. But seven games into the AFL season, are you closer to working out where you sit in this competition? Oh, we've clearly got some work to do. I mean, we sit, the easy answer is we sit four and three. Um, we've beaten three of last year's top five um, and lost games that um, badly that, you know, we thought would be a lot more competitive in. And I think you guys would probably say that, you know, we were a chance to beat, before those games, Essendon, Collingwood and the Gold Coast. But if we'd won them, we'd be sitting here seven and oh, and I'd have the, the fortunate problem of trying to keep my players on track. I mean, how do you explain it then to the supporter base? So you, you, you have these amazing victories over Fremantle and Sydney that you haven't been able to do as a footy club for a long time. You get to Eddie Head Stadium against this young, very talented side who have never won there, mm. and all of a sudden you're staring down the, the, the uh, seven-goal deficit. Yeah. Look, it was really disappointing. I mean, the, I think what it proves uh, to me now is that when you have passengers any week. Uh, you have players who are a little bit off and not just, not massively off, but a little bit off with their effort and work rate. Any side can beat anyone. And I know that sounds a little bit flippant, but in my experience it's true. Can you see that as a coach? Oh, definitely. We, look, the first three goals we conceded against the Gold Coast, we lost uh, some one-on-one -on -one contests, but three times we lost contests where we were five on three. So we, had, we outnumbered by, by two players at the contest and lost the contest. Mm. And when you lose that, when you outnumber the contest, you get killed on the outside. And the Gold Coast are going to hurt some sides on the outside with their speed when you don't win the ball inside. What can you, so just one quick, what can you do then from a coaching box? So you, you've given up three goals and the warning signs are there. You turn to whoever's you know, in the box and you go, boys, we're in trouble. Mm. Can you just shut it down for a quarter so that the damage is mitigated somewhat? Yeah, we did. Um, uh, we had... We put a defender back, uh, an extra defender. Uh, we put our, our hard nuts into the middle to try and, and rest the ascendancy back around the ball. But, um, you know, it's, as a coach, you're, you're really calling out for the, the time out at that point. And we addressed a couple of things at, at quarter time. And look, to the players' credit, they arrested that situation and got back in the game. But we weren't good enough to get the job done in the end. And in the end of the day, we were beaten by a better side on the day. Brad, you've touched on first quarters over the last few days. Last year, it was uh, your last quarters. This year, mm. it's been your first. And you just touched on passengers. Are you not mentally tough enough as a group? And we touched on that last year in regards to, you, know, you shouldn't as a senior coach have to be thinking, do we have to change things up pre-match during the week? Sure, it's between their ears. No, it, look, it's an indictment that uh, you go from being a, a really capable side one week, so it's not a talent issue or a capability issue, to a side that gets um, beaten because of you know, lack of effort in the contest. And you know, so I think that that is an issue. But uh, look, potentially um, I overcorrected and my coaching staff overcorrected in the off season. We were poor defensively last year. Up until last week's game, we sat second in the competition uh, for the defensive side of the game. And so striking that balance has been a real battle for us, mm -hmm. and, and I take responsibility for that. You know, we want to get some... We want to be known as an attacking team. And I don't mean an offensive team. I mean an attacking team, a team that attacks when we haven't got the ball to get the ball back. You're we you attack in the contest, and we attack when we've got it. You're saying you overcorrected. Are you saying that you allowed maybe Lee Tudor to dominate what you felt was best for this club? Oh, not at all, no. We're a... We're a um, you know, a match committee that works together in a collaborative environment. So, no, look, I think it's a bit to do more with our ball movement. The defensive side of the game still holds up when you haven't got the ball, but it's a bit more the way we're moving the ball. So, now I think other clubs would say the same thing. I think Fremantle have gone from wanting to score a little bit more, but when you try and, and fix one part, you potentially uh, put another part in jeopardy. So there's a forward stat there on the screen. So in 2014, you ranked sixth for disposals. You did, you, uh, sorry, ninth in 2013, six. But the scoring mm. goals kicked to 15th as opposed to third, 16th for six. So you think the overcorrection. So you think you sacrificed some of that goal scoring because you wanted to shore up the other end and maybe you tipped too far. Yeah, I, I genuinely think that, and that's that's my responsibility. And uh, I'll, as I always do, go away and work extremely hard on that and work with my coaches to make sure that we're coaching the boys um, with the balance that we need. Brad, another difference from, from this year to last year is expectation in a public sense. Are you dealing with that? And, and is it maybe something the players are, are failing to deal with? 
No, no. That, we talk about it a bit because I think it's really important that young players can um, get put off track yep. uh, if they let it. Um, expectations, criticism, congratulations, pats on the back. Uh, it really does. But has it been there in your five years at this footy club? Criticism's been there. No, on a pretty expect regular basis. expectation <laughs> hasn't. No, criticism yeah. has, but yeah, expectation. If you can, if you can to deal win with a game it. of footy. Yeah, if you can deal with a criticism, I mean, expectation is, is welcome because it means that other people and, and learner journalists like yourselves rated us pre-season. So that's a good thing. Now, I don't think that we bought into that. We know how much work we've got to do and how tight it is between winning a game of footy and losing one. What are you saying on a weekly basis to Drew Petrie? Look, we rate Drew um, as the best. Those are his um, we're having a look at yeah, we're having a look at his, his stats now. I mean, yeah. by, by his reputation, it's been a disappointing year for him. Yeah, by his own uh, admission and own lofty expectations, he's underperforming in the offensive side of the game. Now, I know it's an easy thing for a coach to say that that the defensive side of the game for him has been exceptional. He is is led the way. I thought. He beat Luke McFarlane last week, he kicked the, the winning goal in his 250th game. He's been an icon of our football club and he is leading the way on the training track and he leads the way with defensive pressure. And I'd challenge you to find a better pressure uh, player above 197 centimetres in the competition. So that's the, that's the foundation of his game. Is that what you're saying to him on a weekly basis? Yeah, and I thought he trained really well during the week. Uh, I really expected him to... To, to play a bit better, but he dropped marks he'd never usually drop on the weekend. And, you know, I'll keep working with him, but I'm certainly going to back him in. So it gets highlighted, though, doesn't it, when the others around him aren't picking up the slack. So you, yeah. what you're saying defensively, you're happy with him if, if uh, Mad Jack Dorr or Aaron Black and those boys are hit, or Robbie Tarrant was playing, they're hitting the scoreboard. It's not mm. such a big issue. But is, is he going to get there, Mad Jack? I mean, he's a fascinating story, and we've got to be patient. But will he get there? I think he will. I think he's shown enough already. Uh, look, and a couple of these efforts, what we've got to work with him is that effort in the contest, now get back to the ball. You know, a yeah. couple of times he disappointed me on the weekend when he got outbodied too easily, mm -hmm. he got shepherded out of the contest, and that's going to happen to him, but get back to the ball now, mm -hmm. because he's got elite speed, elite agility, and I think once he puts it all together, I've got real confidence, and I was a little bit misquoted in the pre-season when I said he was unstoppable. Mm -hmm. I said he was unstoppable in certain situations, and what we've got to do is get him in those certain situations more often. What about you, Brad, personally? You're an emotional bloke at times, you've mm. got a temper, like all competitive coaches. Yep. Do, you, do you wear your heart on your sleeve too often in the coach's box? I mean, you probably hate the way that... But you are pretty good. You're very good copy, as they say. Yeah. Oh, is oh, that, that, is the, that an issue? No, no, not at all. I think um, every reaction like that that you would see uh, gets broadcast. Uh, for the other 95 minutes, it's pretty cool, calm and collected. But uh, <laughs> it is. It yeah, is, honestly. No, I'll, yeah. I'll have you into the box, Caroline, if you'd like, um, just to see what it's like for the majority of the game. Because every time you re react like that, it goes on TV. But that being said, um, I probably would like to to not react like that as much as I do. Um, you know, but I do wear my heart on my sleeve and I can guarantee you that emotion doesn't affect my decision making on game day. Brad, have you seen the vision of uh, Sean Hart giving Ken Hinckley the tap in the box? Yeah. Uh, have you ever considered having someone sit over the top of you and manage your emotions in the box or you don't think you, you need well, it? No, I certainly don't need it. No, and Jeff Walsh does that, okay. uh, as a matter of fact. Um, and Ken Hinckley almost, he almost clipped hard, yeah. didn't he? he almost, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. gave one, so I don't think Walsh is going to be doing that anytime soon. Uh, yeah, just on a broader picture, we had Gil McLaughlin in the um, Triple M box on the weekend, and he said that he would like to sit down with you boys, you boys being the coaches, and talk about the look of the game and where mm. it was going and what obligation you've got. Uh, I want to have you listen to what uh, Damien Hardwick said in his press conference after the loss on the weekend at Geelong. Uh, against a side like Geelong who's owned a fair bit we're probably looking to go to stoppage a little bit more but just couldn't get the ball out of bounds and you give it back and they punish you on the scoreboard and you know, like I said they've got a couple of goals where you know even that goal by Murdoch at the end which was just a, a cracking goal uh, we just couldn't quite get the, uh, the ball out of bounds at various stages or through the points. The obligation is clear from the coaching point of view is to win and win the way that you um, coach and the way you think you can Gil watches that and says, I've got a senior coach there who's trying to get the ball out of bounds. That's not going to help the aesthetic of the game. What's your obligation? No, our obligation is to the game. I mean, we do direct uh, the way the game is played as a coaching group. Uh, and the game has evolved based on coaching tactics, not so much rule changes. Uh, so that's why I've always been an advocate to leave the game alone and let it evolve naturally. Change the rules if it's going to affect player health and safety. But for the, the look of the game, it will evolve. It'll go through through 
peaks where the footy's fantastic and you're always going to have your poor games. But the, the, the question there is, will, it will evolve into what? Yeah, well, I think I, I'm not an alarmist either, Gary. Mm. I know you're not. Mm. Um, but I think the good games are as good as ever. I think the, the Geelong Hawthorne game, the, the Geelong Port Adelaide game are outstanding games, but we've got some poor games. There's no doubt about that. But I, I'd welcome the opportunity to sit down with Gil, um, and I think Gil would, would find out very quickly that he'd have 18 coaches that genuinely care about the look of the game yeah. and would want to work together to make sure that it's a game the fans still love and parents want their kids playing. Brad, what about North Melbourne as a footy club? I want to ask you, there was you know, stats on how many clubs actually make a profit within the game. How far behind are North Melbourne still in what you'd like with, say, development coaches, everything that goes with uh, just being com as competitive as you can be off the field? Are you still a fair way behind? Well, it's really hard to compare because I don't have a, an inside yeah. look at other clubs, but what I can say is that James Brayshaw has been outstanding for me. Um, Jeff Walsh is, is, I think, you know, one of the best footy administrators in the country. Uh, I've got a great panel of assistant coaches, um, so, and I've got a great new facility and great redeveloped Arden Street. So. Um, I can't complain, certainly with what I've got at my disposal. Brett, I think I saw you offset a moment ago looking at the, uh, the Jack Viney incident. Yep. Mm. Can I get your take on, on what you think the tribunal will do tomorrow with that? They may pay the fine. What I, <laughs> what I think they'll do and what I hope they do are probably two different things. I don't think Jack had time to make a decision to tackle yep. the, the ball. Clearly, it was, he wasn't in possession of the ball, Lynch, so he really couldn't tackle him. Really split-second decision. Now. All clubs had the opportunity to answer this question pre-season. When Lindsay Thomas wasn't suspended last year for a bump on Ben Reid, 85% of clubs said he should have been because he should have been responsible for that action. Mm. So the Fife decision, the Viney decision, uh, probably the Douglas decision is a result of that feedback from clubs. I certainly didn't agree with the, the, the rule change. Do you think there are rules of the week, Brad, in regard yeah. there are? Definitely, yeah. 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 So how, for how often would you get spoken to throughout a year that there's adjustments, like in terms of taggers recently? I think that's got harder for taggers since yeah. the Cochin McCaffrey not. Yeah, there has. But I'll, look, I'm, I don't... We haven't approached the, uh, the umpires once this year. Um, and we've certainly had some decisions we didn't agree with, but that's going to happen every week. But they say there's no rules of the week, but you believe oh, there are? Oh, they definitely focus on things, and I think they've admitted that, that they focus on certain things they've been missing. But my attitude is uh, the umpires have got a job to do. They're being well coached by Hayden Kennedy. Uh, it's not my job to critique them. We'll just tell the players to play the ball and, and let the umpires do their job. Hey, mate, we appreciate you coming in. The hard thing for us is to wind it up because we've only got a certain amount of time. But it's great to hear you speak and it's great to hear uh, your passion and care about the game. I think that's a wonderful message tonight. And good luck. Got the bye, so you've got a couple of weeks to get back on track. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.